Hello, everybody. Welcome. We are going to begin at 7 p.m. So we'll look forward to getting started in a little bit. Thanks for joining us. Hello and welcome to our webinar. We are going to officially begin at 7 p.m., but we are recording now, it looks like. Um, there's a few questions about whether or not we're recording now. In education webinar series, we are recording now, so I want to make everyone aware of that. That includes what you might put in the chat. So if you prefer to remain anonymous, please stay out of the chat. Otherwise, come join us in the chat and tell us who you are and where you are. I am Robin DeRosa, and I am coming from you, to you, from a blizzard in New Hampshire. Um, so we had originally hoped that all of us who are on site here in New Hampshire would be together at the Plymouth Open Learning and Teaching Collaborative, um, but unfortunately we were snowed out and snowed in. Um, so as a result, I'm home in front of the fire with my dog and my whole family, and there'll be all sorts of things running around as we do this webinar, but we're all glad you're here and that everybody is um, joining us, so thank you. Uh, this webinar series is part of a broader series from the Academic Technology Institute here at the University System of New Hampshire. There is one more uh, webinar in the series, New Perspectives on Inclusive Teaching. Um, but tonight we are talking about ungrading, and I'm glad you're here. A couple things before you meet the team and we start. Um, so I want to tell you that, uh, again, you can introduce yourself over in the chat. As you've probably noticed, all participants are muted. We do have a couple hundred people registered for the webinar. So um, the best way to communicate will be through the chat. But also, if you want to ask a question, just use that little Q&A button down at the bottom. Um, and one of our panelists here will be mon uh, monitoring that and will try to get to questions. Also, our panelists can answer questions after the webinar on Twitter. So we'll do the best we can uh, to get to all of you as, as we're able. Um, we also want to let you know that you can follow along with the slides, particularly for accessibility reasons, if that's helpful, by going to bit.ly slash usnh-ungrading-slides, if that helps you. Um, we will be releasing this webinar as a recording, um, and it'll me immediately come out through Zoom as a recording, but then we will also, it might take us a few days, caption the video, so you'll be able to share it um, with your audiences that way as well. Um, with that, since I am in the house, and that was just for effect, I'm going to take off my ridiculous hat. Um, and introduce you to the great team of folks that are here talking with us about ungrading. Um, so I am the director of the Open Learning and Teaching Collaborative, which is a center at Plymouth State University. We're right in the middle of the state, part of the public university system of New Hampshire. And I have a whole bunch of my friends and comrades from PSU with me, including um, my uh, co-chair, comrade, sidekick, Martha Burtis, uh, and um, Jess Christian, who works with me in the collab as well and is a senior at Plymouth State. Um, Laura is a professor of anthropology, and Matt works in the collab and directs our interdisciplinary studies program. And Kathy uh, coordinates our gen ed as, and is a professor of communication and media studies. Um, in addition, we have two special guests who are Zooming in from all sorts of remote parts of this great nation. Uh, Jesse Stommel, who is the Senior Lecturer and Digital Learning Fellow um, and Digital Studies Professor at the University of Mary Washington, and Clarissa Sorensen Unruh, um, who teaches chemistry for all of you STEM fans. She'll be talking about that. She's at Central New Mexico community college. Um, you can access uh, this slide deck later and find all of our Twitter handles. So feel free to be in touch with any of us anytime. Um, and we will try to engage with you as we can. 
the way the webinar is going to work is that um, Martha is actually going to give kind of a foundational um, look at different strategies for ungrading. And I think what you'll find out pretty quickly is that ungrading is a big continuum and there is not one way to ungrade. Um, so if you were looking for sort of best practice, this is probably not the webinar for you. But if you're looking for lots of people practicing, you've come to the right place. So Martha's going to give that, uh, that background. And then uh, three of our folks at Plymouth State are going to talk about what ungrading has meant for them in their particular classrooms, uh, particularly this year, as lots of us have started experimenting more deliberately with ungrading as part of a learning community um, that we're running at Plymouth State. Uh, after that, we will have our respondents, and that will include um, a student perspective and a STEM perspective and a Jesse perspective, which, you know, one never knows my, what might come with that, and then a chance for all of you guys to ask questions. So with that, I'm going to turn it over uh, to Martha Burtis, who's going to take it away um, for the next 15 minutes or so. Hi, everybody. My name, as Robin said, is Martha. I work here at Plymouth State in the Open Collab. Um, and what I really want to start with um, is this question, before we even get to um, what some of the practices are of ungrading, why are we interested in doing this in the first place? Um, why would we you know, toss out so much tradition around traditional grades in order to investigate and try out different things when it comes to assessment with our students? And for me, um, this is kind of where it started for me which is that I found that in my own practices as, as an instructor and as a teacher, grading had become the language that I spoke with students. And more and more, I felt like that wasn't the language I wanted to be speaking with them. Um, that translated into things like when students would come to see me rather than us talking about their learning, talking about their experience of learning in my class, um, what they would immediately focus on and what our conversation would evolve from would be, what's my grade? Um, why did I lose those points? What um, can I do to get them back? Um, and I felt like that was just not the way that I wanted those conversations to emerge with my students. Um, on each of the slides that I'm going to show you here, as you'll see, I have a quote. Um, when I put these together, actually, for a workshop here at Plymouth State last fall, I, I really wanted to forefront the words of people who were doing ungrading. Um, and so you'll see quotes, some of, some of those, these quotes are from people who'll be talking tonight. Some are from um, practitioners and, um, and scholars and teachers um, who talk and think and practice um, alternative assessment. This one is from Lisa Lane. Um, and I think it really captures this whole concept of um, rethinking the language that we have with students. She says, I've had students say to me, I hope you don't think less of me because I did a bad job on this paper. Of course I don't. What on earth gave them that idea? Well, years of school where the grade was used to represent them, when someone punished them for poor grades, and where they were called a D student. Um, and that probably resonates with a lot of us. Um, I know I've been um, guilty of using language like that and talking about students um, forefronting grades as a way of not only measuring them, but a way of describing them. Um, in addition, um, I really wanted to speak, when I shifted that language, I really wanted um, what emerged to be a language about learning and not about grading. Um, I wanted to promote this idea of a growth mindset um, and suggest to students that there were other things that we could be talking about that were more important and more valuable to their experience um, than the grade that they had right at this moment in my class or um, the mark I had given them on the latest draft of their paper. Um, this is a quote from Laura Gibbs. I explicitly teach students about giving and receiving feedback so that they can give each other helpful feedback and also make good use of the feedback they receive. As part of that process, I teach students about growth mindset and the positive value of learning from mistakes. And just in this quote, I think we can start to see the shift there um, to starting to use language and language that forefronts a very different kind of experience in our classroom, one that isn't about grades and evaluation, but that is about feedback. Um, and not only our feedback of students, but their feedback, um, giving themselves feedback, giving their peers feedback, bringing them into that conversation so that they can start to see what it is we're looking at and for in, in their learning. This is something that I think a lot of us probably um, 
probably have struggled with. It's, it's something that it's, it's kind of a thread through so many conversations about assessment, um, which is the notion that without grades, we cannot be objective um, and we can't be fair. Um, and I know this was something that I, as a, as a teacher, really struggled with. Um, I felt like if I wasn't grading, then I would lose that objectivity. Um, but I started to realize more and more that that objectivity wasn't real. Um, in the workshop that we had here last fall at PSU about ungrading, Kathy LeBlanc, who you'll hear from later, um, termed this objectivity theater, um, where it feels good. Um, you know, we've created rubrics, we've created systems, we've created an evaluatory framework in our heads that makes us feel objective and fair. Um, but the reality is that I'm sure everybody's experienced this. I would sit down to grade a set of papers one night when I was in a great mood um, and feeling pretty good about how things were going in the class. And then I might return to a second set of papers a day or two later when I was in a different mindset for whatever reason. And that would affect how I would read those papers. And I would find myself sort of juggling back and forth between stacks of papers, trying to assess and compare things that really were not comparable, um, not in ways that really made any sense. Um, and this quote, um, I think, also captures another aspect of this. I first became interested in this approach when I realized how traditional grading practices inadvertently punished the students at my alternative high school for things outside their control, poverty, mood disorders, unstable home lives. So in addition to the fact that objectivity is almost unattainable in our own um, attempts to, to create these frameworks and, um, and, and uh, sort of evaluative systems, um, the reality is that our students are all coming from different places. Um, and there isn't really an objective way of measuring um, them across a, a standard set of practices. Um, and so more and more, I felt like that fairness, that thing that we kind of held up as a goal um, of grading wasn't even a real thing. Um, when I was looking for quotes, this was one of the hardest um, concepts to really find people talking about, but it was definitely something that I had struggled with, which was that for me, I sometimes joke that um, grades are almost grades are almost the dues that we feel like we have to pay in order to get to be teachers. <laughs> Um, there's so much we love about teaching that if you talk to people about teaching, they'll invariably tell you the thing that they don't like is grading. Um, nobody really enjoys grading. Um, but it feels like the thing that we have to do, it feels like the way in which we make visible to people um, the labor that we put into, um, into our teaching. Um, talking about how much time we spend on grading, um, how much effort goes into setting up rubrics and creating assignments in such a way that we can grade them in objective ways. Um, it really is part of our own understanding of our practice. And letting go of that felt almost like I was, um, like I was getting away with something. Um, and it left me almost feeling kind of, kind of guilty, a little bit of shame around it. There are still times when I think, um, is it really okay that I'm doing it this way? Um, here's a quote from Elizabeth Barr. There is nothing more demoralizing than the thought that the countless hours we spend grading might be dismissed as meaningless. Um, so that, that practice of grading, it really, it, it's a currency that we trade around um, in, in education and that we depend upon. Um, so what does it mean when we say that that doesn't matter anymore? It isn't, it, we don't believe in it anymore. Um, what does that represent to us in terms of our own understanding of who we are as instructors and as teachers? And finally, and I think this is, this was probably the, the thing, the realization when I came to it that really kind of convinced me that I needed to seek alternative methods of um, addressing or thinking about assessment in my classes, um, which is that when you really start to look at the research, when you really start to look at um, um, the evidence that's out there, grades impede learning. Um, there is research and um, and writing out there that you can, we have link, we'll share links with this about this at the end um, that you can spend lots of time looking at that um, shows pretty clearly um, that grades get in the way of the relationships that we're trying to build with students and helping them to build intrinsic motivation around their learning. Uh, the very first time I, I started ungrading in a class was in a first year seminar when I was teaching at the University of Mary Washington. And um, for those of you who've ever taught first year seminars, it was kind of a, 
what you expect in a class like that. It's, a, it's meant to be an introduction um, for students to the, the community of the university, to the academic community, help them get oriented, help them understand what's going to be expected of them, what they can come to expect in courses. And I thought, is it fair for me to introduce a grading um, system, a grading um, an assessment approach that's probably never, probably different from anything else they're ever going to experience in their four years um, at, at the school, shouldn't be, I be orienting them to what's more common? Um, and I decided that, um, that, I, that I decided I wanted to, to try it anyway. And one of the first things I did on the first day of class is I asked students, I explained it to them, and I asked them how many of you are uncomfortable with this or nervous about this. And several of them raised their hands. And I sent them home that night and I asked them to read Elfie Cohn's essay, um, The Case Against Grades. And they came back to class the next time and we started to talk about it. And it was great because they had very quickly absorbed by doing that reading that there was a real problem with grading. Um, they were a little bit outraged. <laughs> they were like, if there's been all this evidence for so long that this is detrimental, that this isn't, um, this isn't serving us well, why, why are people continuing to grade us? Um, and at the, from that point on, it really changed the, the conversation that we had in class about assessment um, and about grading. So now I wanna talk um, a little bit about some of the practices when we talk about alternative assessment or ungrading, what are we actually talking about? Um, and as Robin already alluded to, there is no one way to do this. There's also no right way to do this. Um, what's right is what works for you um, and what, um, what, what you find comfortable in your own practices of teaching and in your own relationships with students and your own conversations with students. But hopefully we can give you some ideas of places to start and things that you might wanna try if you're new to this. Um, probably one of the most common techniques that gets mentioned and the one that I'm most familiar with that I do regularly in my classes is self-assessment and relatedly peer assessment. Um, so this really relies on having students um, do assessment of their own work um, and their own development in the class, usually um, a couple of times a semester. Um, and you can approach this in different ways. When I do self-assessment, I tend to do it in, depending on the class, some classes it's pretty structured, um, particularly if I'm working with first year students, I may be a little bit more directive about uh, questions that I want them to think about. Um, an answer or topics that I want them to talk about. Um, whereas in a, in a you know, senior level class, um, like a, a class where I've had students doing more of capstone projects, that assessment um, is a little bit more driven by the project themselves and their experience in the course. Um, this is a quote from Jesse who will be talking later. Um, my specific approach has evolved over 17 years. Currently I have students write self-reflections two to three times throughout the term. The first is usually more directed than the last. Um, getting at that whole idea too, that when you're introducing students to doing self-assessment and doing it well, um, they may need um, help getting to that place where they can do it in a more self-directed way. Um, he goes on, my goal is to help students develop their ability to do this kind of metacognitive work. Self-evaluation and metacognition are not easy even for me, so I give students space to figure out how to do this work as they go. I think one of the things that's important to point out here is very often when we talk about self-assessment, students have already experienced it in some way, and the way that they experienced it may not have been particularly useful or healthy. Um, so they may have self-assessed before, but it may not have been framed very well. It may have been part of a traditional um, grading approach, and so they may not see it as um, something that has any real stake to it. Um, so introducing a self-assessment also means having conversation with students about why this matters, um, why what they're doing here is actually of great importance to you, um, that it's not a throwaway assignment, um, it's not busy work, it's actually in some ways the most meaningful work that they do in your class. Um, and I think that sometimes gets lost when we talk about self-assessment. Um, um, Process letters are sort of related. I know Jesse can talk a little bit more about this because he's, um, he's used them for quite a while. They are a particular form of self-assessment that tend to be um, a little bit more open-ended um, in, in having students write you a letter, particularly at the end of say a term um, where they really summarize and describe for you the learning that they've done and the work that they've um, created over the course of the term. Um, and as Jesse says in this quote, he's experimented with having students do things like add pictures, um, 
add voice, voice over a screencast, have them shoot video, uh, almost creating a documentary about their own learning in the class so that they really have to step back from just doing the assessment and think about how they're presenting their assessment as well. Um, and, one, and that distance can sometimes create some space for them to be a little bit more metacognitive about, um, about the process. So moving on from there, um, great, so grade-free zones is I think an important point to make, which is that when you um, tackle un ungrading, you decide you wanna um, investigate this as a practice for yourself, that doesn't mean that you need to ungrade an entire class. Um, and it may be that the first step that you take is um, sort of uh, using some of these approaches just on a single assignment, a single project, or just for a couple of weeks of the class. Um, so this is sometimes referred to as a grade-free zone. Um, it's a great tool for you to both kind of ease into the practice, as well as a way for you to introduce um, into the conversation with your students the meaning of grades and why we grade in different ways in different contexts. Um, this is a quote from Irvin Peckham, teachers who have overcome their addictions to grades and create in their classrooms a grade-free zone of trust, appreciation, teacher-student collaboration, and love of writing will see from their students more and better writing. They will see that their students really want to learn. So sometimes by just creating that space, um, an opportunity to kind of let go of grades for a couple of weeks or for an assignment or two, it just frees up the conversation that when you go back to traditional grading, um, you can pick up there with a sort of a different tenor, a different approach to even the traditional grading as well. So now we're getting into um, a few really specific, more specific practices. Um, and I know that some of the people who are going to be speaking later have experience with um, the, some of these very um, specific um, ideas, so I'll let them talk about those in more detail. But this one is, is minimal grading. This comes from Peter Elbow. Um, and if, you, if you're interested in this, his website is a, is a treasure trove of resources. Um, his background is in composition. A lot of ungrading kind of assessment um, has developed out of the world of composition. Um, and so what he really suggests is taking a minimal grading approach where um, you know, right now, depending on your grading scale at your institution, you probably have between 11 and 13 letter grades that you can give students, um, which when you stop to think about it, is just a huge number of options. Um, and so he suggests um, instead for, for particular assignments having maybe um, a minimal grading scale of, of maybe three options. So um, insufficient, um, satisfactory and excellent, for example, or even a pass-fail um, option, or he even does ones for really low stakes assignments where it's just, um, you get it if you get credit if you did it, essentially. Um, he talks a lot about how you do this with low stakes assignments versus high stakes assignments. A lot of times people assume that minimal grading only works with low stakes assignments, um, but he actually makes a pretty strong case um, case for um, using this in higher stakes, larger projects, larger papers. Um, but a lot of it has to do with making sure if you're going to do this as a way to ultimately arrive at some final assessment of a student's work in a semester, doing it at a scale with enough assignments, enough variety of assignments that you really have a rich view of a student's development um, through this practice. From him, um, his quote, even though minimal grading removes the incentive to strive for an A for excellence, we get to ask students to write far more than if we had to grade everything carefully. We um, get to ask them to think actively about far more of the course material. So by pulling back from the labor that you have to do on um, doing really um, big uh, grading practices on every assignment, having lots more assignments with minimal grading, so students are practicing more, they're generating more, they're writing more, or whatever it is they might be doing in your class, um, and, you, and you then have a much easier time um, because what you're doing is a minimal grading approach to those. Um, related to, sort of related to that is this idea of contract grading. Contract grading is, an, is interesting because it doesn't necessarily remove grades at all. It actually in some ways kind of forefronts grades, um, but it does it in a really interesting way. You, you set out at the beginning of the class, sometimes you might do this in conversation with students or you might make the determination yourself of what it would take within a class to get an A. 
to get a B, to get a C, and you, um, you make that really explicit to students um, that so many assignments um, it, from this group, um, coupled with so many assignments from this group, um, will get you a B in this class. And then if students want to get an A, they have to go a little bit further, they have to do a little bit more. Um, what I like about this approach is that if, if you've never had a conversation with your students at some point about what grade they're hoping to get in a class, um, it's a really useful conversation to have. If the first time that I did it, it was really eye-opening. I joke sometimes that, you know, I think those of us who work in higher education always expect that our students are like we were. And many of us were probably high achievers, not all of us, but many of us were probably high achievers in school and, and anxious to get um, high grades. Um, and so the first time I really started to unpack this with students, it was sort of revelatory to me that they were, they were not all expecting to get an A in a class. That didn't mean that they couldn't get an A or that they, they couldn't earn, it, earn an A. Um, but what it did is it, it kind of threw the whole, um, it, it kind of exposed sort of that disconnect between what I might assume and what they expected and then allowed us to just on an even playing field talk about what grades even represented. With contract grading, you really do that because students literally can say, I really want to get a B plus in this class. So I'm going to work to the contract to try and achieve that in this particular way. Um, and it's sort of measurable and visible to them. Um, this, Martha, that's your, that's your time notice. So keep on going. Okay. Um, I am almost done. Um, spec grading and bundled assignments are kind of when we bring contract grading and minimal grading together. Um, so with spec grading and bundled assignments, you would have a set of minimally graded assignments um, that you would then bundle into groups that students would have to work on in order to achieve a particular grade. Um, I, I'm blanking now on the name of the, um, the person. There's a, it's in our, in our um, resource that we'll be sharing at the end. Um, the woman who has really sort of um, shared this technique really widely, um, but she's done tons of writing about this if this is something that you're interested in. Um, and I'll move on to um, ungraded exams, with, which Rissa can talk about a little bit more, which is basically applying all of this to a more traditional exam um, approach of an assignment. Um, and formative assessment, which is sort of a thread through all of this. It's not so much an ungrading technique as it is a mindset that I think it's important for all of us to keep in mind, which is um, using our, our conversation with students, not so much to grade them, but to give them feedback that they can use to then improve their work um, and to shift that conversation with them um, so that what they're looking for isn't a grade, what they're looking for is feedback. Um, that was part of my initial practice with ungrading was really um, forefronting formative assessment more. Um, and at this point, I'm going to turn it over. Great. I have uh, so many tabs up and so many chats running that I literally don't know what is going on. Um, but thank you, Martha. And lots of people talking in the chat about resources and how are we gonna get all this? So I just wanna make sure I publicly say, we will be publishing um, a recording of this video. We'll be captioning that as soon as we can. Um, and also at the end of this, uh, we will share a resource document with you and then some other surprises that are coming later. So have no fear. Um, and that chat will also be published. So you will be able to get to it um, again. Okay, we're going to move on now to talk to some practitioners who are working with ungrading in their courses um, now. And most of them have done really interesting experiments with ungrading um, for years. But I think it's only been recently that most of us um, have started really deliberately thinking about ungrading, particularly institutionally. So we're going to hear from people who are working in our learning community and thinking about ungrading. And we're going to start with Kathy LeBlanc. Um, so I will let Kathy um, introduce herself and tell us a little bit about the course where she was working on this. Hi, everyone. I've been uh, thinking about grading and how much I hate it for a really long time. Um, but it's been really wonderful to be part of the learning community at Plymouth State where we're deliberately talking about uh, ways that we can do this and uh, give our students lots of examples of how this might happen. So I'm going to talk a little bit about a class I taught this past fall 
our first year seminar. It's called Tackling the Wicked Problem. And uh, it's a graded class. It's a four credit graded class. Uh, the students are all first year, first semester students. And what I did was I used our learning management system as a way, as, as a place where we would keep track of what the assignments were that students did and what my feedback was on, on that. In order to make ungrading work, I started right from the very first day talking about what learning is. What are grades for? What's the relationship between grades and learning? And most importantly, how do you demonstrate learning? It's, it's kind of shocking that students don't really understand sometimes why they're given assignments. And so having an explicit conversation about the relationship between those assignments and um, practice of the material that you're, you're learning in the class and as a way of demonstrating your learning, that's a, that's a new concept for, for lots of them. The class has uh, several moments of self-reflection for the students. We started right at the very beginning where I asked them to self-reflect about, this is a general education class, so ask them to reflect on their current level of achievement on our habits of mind, which are the learning outcomes for the general education program. So right at the very beginning, they, they talked about what they already knew about these learning outcomes and um, set goals for themselves about the areas that they might wanna work on. I gave them feedback on those self-reflections and typically tried to pick just one or two things to, to write about in the feedback. But the, that feedback often became individual conversations with students about their particular goals for their entire education, um, but also their goals for, for the class. Like I said, we, uh, this class is a graded class, and I, so I had to assign grades twice during the semester. We, we have a system of six week grades. So after six weeks, every student gets a grade that kind of is supposed to tell them how they're doing so far in the class. And then of course, at the end of the semester. Because we had already had several conversations about grades and learning and how do you demonstrate what you're learning and what the grades are for, we revisited those conversations and I asked the students to go into our learning management system to just review all of the feedback, to look at the assignments they had completed, what they had not completed. And then they um, did a self-reflection where they articulated the, the grade that they believe they had earned and why. And uh, I gave them feedback on that. So uh, occasionally I would, I would say, you know, I think you're judging yourself too harshly or not harshly enough and here's why. And that also led to some individual conversations. In the end, uh, at the end of the semester, they were pretty on target uh, as to what they, they had earned in the class in terms of, like if I were actually giving grades on all of these assignments, I think that's probably where they would have ended up anyway. So I, I, it, it, I think was a successful experiment but more successful because of all of the conversations about learning and what, what grades are for. That's it. Thanks, Kathy. Um, I am going to pause for just a minute and um, quickly myself answer a couple of questions that have come up in the Q&A and then um, we'll keep on going. We're gonna take some more questions later. Um, the first is from uh, Jeffrey Kane, and this was also came out from Travis and others in the chat. Um, I would love to hear um, any advice you might have for adjuncts to promote these ideas without losing their jobs. Um, and obviously, I'm not going to answer that question um, exactly, but I'm just going to throw it out into the ether so everybody can th be thinking about it. But I do want to say that in our learning community, we had, um, we call them teaching lecturers at Plymouth State, and we had uh, quite a few teaching lecturers participating in these conversations and we have lots of conversations about who has the privilege to take risk in pedagogy 
Um, and also many of us have had the experience of pushback from students um, in moving to ungrading. And so the very real ways that those things can affect your course evaluations and what that means when you're um, contingent and how long it can take to adjust your pedagogy and find your footing. But when you're being evaluated on a semester to semester basis, that can be a real challenge. So um, all the panelists can be thinking about that, but I just wanted to acknowledge that it's um, a real contingency and precarity are a real issue behind lots of the risk taking that we've been talking about in our learning community at Plymouth State. Um, there was also another question about how do we get our institutions on board with this, um, that institutions can give pushback about ungrading. Um, and I will say that one thing that has been very helpful for us is, and one of the reasons I think that Plymouth has uh, kind of seen, like when Martha came on board recently, she was sort of like, your entire institution's ungrading, like what's going on? Um, and it was a real, because lots of us have been doing this for years, but I think there was a big difference when we started having um, a uh, institutional conversation about it. And we linked some new pedagogies, particularly um, integrated learning, project-based learning, and open education. Um, Kathy worked uh, on a grant with the Davis Foundation to fund the development of a sort of pedagogical approach for Plymouth State that merged those pedagogies. And so we put ungrading um, uh, in there as one of the tools we might use to explore some new, new ways of teaching. Um, what I'd really like to suggest is that anytime you can build a community of people um, to try to work together and involve your administration and all levels, including staff at your institution in the conversations, I think that that helps. And many of us uh, are interested in what changes when we start thinking about this as an institutional shift in pedagogy and not just a, um, an individual one. Linking that to student success outcomes through open education and project-based learning has been really helpful for us um, as well. So more on that stuff later, uh, but we are gonna keep moving and ask uh, Laura, who's a professor of anthropology at Plymouth State to talk next. You're up, Laura. All right, hi everyone, thanks so much. Um, I am happy to talk to you about how to do this if you're really scared of doing it <laughs> or maybe you're logging in and you're like, oh, I already designed my whole semester and I'm hearing about all these cool things. How am I going to do this? So I've taken the approach of kind of uh, when Martha was talking about this, I guess it's more along the lines of the grade free zone. I haven't fully committed, but I've carved out some spaces where grades are not really a factor or they're very different from traditional grading in my classes. And I'll be talking about some ways to approach that. So the way I sort of started thinking about this, I was really excited to try it, but also very nervous. And my advice for anyone thinking about this is where to start is to think about areas of your classes where um, either A, the grades really seem arbitrary even to you as you're assigning them, or B, um, you want to sort of add a little bit more joy and fun and room for experimentation and, and sort of relieve the pressure valve that uh, grading sort of um, can inhibit all of that. So I'll talk about a little bit of some things that I've tried in my classes that have worked really well. Um, I have in some of my upper level classes, for example, um, uh, uh, reading assignments, I really want students to come to class uh, having read assignments. And so that used to be part of um, something that they would do for, for a grade. They would uh, have reading guide questions or reading quizzes I've used in the past as well. Um, really, I wasn't really trying to assess uh, the reading comprehension as much as just trying to motivate them to stay up, keep up with the reading. So the grade, again, it seemed kind of arbitrary. To some degree, it seemed like not really the grade wasn't the point, but the point was to get them to be motivated to do the reading and come to class with questions. So I've made those, um, instead of a graded assignment, just something that they submit. I look it over, um, it helps me sort of um, guide discussions and class activities, but they get full credit if they submit it uh, on time, even if they totally botched their answers to the questions. I just know that they've at least thought about those things before they've come to class. So they're essentially ungraded or, you know, complete incomplete is how it looks like in our learning management system in the grade book. Um, I've also um, rethought a lot about how I do participation. I know a lot of professors just 
don't grade participation because it is so arbitrary. Um, I always wanted to, that to be part of uh, my class grade um, because I wanted students to think about that as a really valuable and essential part of the class experience. But again, those grades are really arbitrary. Uh, we know that they reward people that have kind of been trained to raise their hand and it relies a lot on our very subjective memory of what went on during classes. So that seemed like a really easy um, aspect of my class that I could just remove my role as a grader. Um, it's still a part of the grade, but what I've uh, shifted to is um, self evaluations for participation. And I have students actually set goals at the start of the semester based on skills that um, uh, that will help them participate in class. And then they assess themselves whether or not they've reached their goals and they um, I, I didn't come up with this by myself. There was a great article in, I think, um, a journal devoted to teaching sociology that I, I stole from that, and it's working really well. So it's self-evaluated, and we um, work on it. They have a couple of chances to do that. I give them feedback. But my that arbitrary grade that I assigned at the end of the semester for participation in class is no longer a factor. Um, I still have a lot of traditionally as, uh, graded uh, assignments. But I think in the spirit of ungrading um, and kind of referring back to some of the things that Martha was talking about earlier that are really problematic with grading, um, how they really disadvantage certain students that have um, difficult home lives or a lot of stuff going on outside of class that impacts their uh, ability to do assess, uh, assignments, but is kind of outside of their control. Um, I've just rethought a lot about my um, policies and made them so much more flexible so that even if I am, am assigning a grade or assessing them, um, that they're not penalized um, heavily for, you know, missing a very arbitrary cutoff deadline. Or I give a lot more flexibility in terms of um, topics um, or format in which they do an assignment. So I think it's not, it's still graded, but I think in the spirit of ungrading, you can make those much more flexible and students really appreciate that flexibility in, in all of the ways it can manifest. Um, so I think I'll, in the interest of time, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that and I'll pass my time on to the next presenter. You will yield to the next <laughs> I will yield. <laughs> God, don't let me say anything related to Congress in any way. Okay, um, let's go on to Matthew Cheney, uh, who is Professor of Interdisciplinary Studies, which is a customized major program here at Plymouth State. And with that, Matt, you are up. Thank you, Robin. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm going to talk about contract grading, which Martha uh, talked about briefly before even though I don't currently do it because I'm lucky enough to teach uh, in classes that are all pass no pass courses uh, within the interdisciplinary studies program where I answer to mostly myself and Robin uh, so I can uh, be as radical as I feel necessary but for a long time I wasn't in that privileged a position I was an adjunct for five years I was a grad student for five years I was a high school teacher before that uh, and the closest I got to truly ungrading in those experiences was through various forms of contract grading. It's a really useful middle ground, uh, or as Kathy Davidson said in the quote that Martha gave us, it's a workaround. And I, I don't think that's a slam against it. I think it's actually one of its great virtues. The basic idea is simply showing the students do this and you will get a particular grade. Um, there are lots of different ways to set that out. Sometimes I did contracts that laid out all A through F grades. Do this, you'll get an A, do this, you'll get a B, etc. Um, other times, and the, the last contract I used, and I think really the most effective, was simply what we called a B contract. And that's what I've put on the slide uh, that's in front of you. The basic idea of the, the B contract was um, really not about ungrading, it was about reducing anxiety for students. Some friends and I, as graduate students at the University of New Hampshire, uh, put this into practice. We sort of stole it from Peter Elbow. You'll see there's a link in the slide deck uh, to Peter Elbow's, some of Peter Elbow's writings about this. 
Uh, and we were, we were really looking for ways to reduce our students' anxieties about what their grades were and their uh, frequently wanting to know, what do I have to do to get an A? Um, am I getting an A? Did I get an A yesterday? Did I get an A a minute ago? How am I getting an A? And uh, this was just getting frustrating. So we put the B contract into practice in a few different ways. Um, and the one that seemed to work best is the one that I've put on the slide there where um, I've sort of broken it down into a bit of a template for you there and taken out a few of our course specific things. Um, but it just said to the students, if you do all of the following, you'll get at least a B in this course. And that at least I'll come back to in a moment. That's an important part. So we said, we guarantee you, I will absolutely guarantee you contract like that if you do not miss more than blank number of classes, um, I usually would put in a week's worth of classes, whatever that was, usually it was two days. Um, sometimes three. Uh, if you don't miss more than that, you'll get a B. If you, if you complete all assignments and activities on time according to the guidelines and your work demonstrates effort and care, um, that, that's another component, consistently demonstrating effort on pure feedback activities, revising drafts at each stage, uh, and carefully copy editing all the, the drafts that were evaluated. I only evaluated a few um, but by following proofreading guidelines that I gave them. This is for a composition class. So that's why, why all the writing and revision and stuff. Um, and I said, do all of these things and I guarantee you, no matter what, you will have at least a B. Um, then there, there became an interesting squishy room, which was in that at least a B part or in the very subjective things like what does it mean to demonstrate effort? Um, and that turned out to be really useful because it was an instigator to interesting conversations. And that's one of the reasons I really like self-evaluations as part of all of this is because it, kind of, it puts grading into the foreground and helps students really start thinking about it and not take it as some sort of secret thing that teachers control or this kind of platonic ideal or something like that. Instead, it really gets them thinking about what their grade is, what contributes to that grade, how it comes about. And ultimately, my experience was that the contract itself didn't really matter all that much. What mattered was the self-evaluation because then the students had a framework to start thinking about their grades and I then could respond to them uh, through their self-evaluations. And it was in the response that really, I felt like uh, I was doing the best sort of teaching and also learning myself about the effects of these sort of grading systems. Um, so that's one approach to contract grading. There are others, Peter Elbow's website has a bunch, uh, but especially I think it's useful for folks who are in, this is, this is one for instance, that'd be great for, for folks in somewhat precarious roles. This is also a great way to sort of ease your way into um, an ungrading kind of approach that gives you a way to talk with your students about grading. Thanks. Um, I have a question for our three practitioners. Maybe one of you could um, kind of raise a hand if you'd be willing to answer this question. It comes from Christina. Um, how do you manage the ebb and flow of grading and ungrading when there's inconsistent submissions and flexibility with deadlines? I know at least some of you have wrestled with this. Does anybody want to offer some strategies? Well, I will say welcome to my life. Uh, <laughs> that this is I, I have very flexible course policies. You can, if you look up my stuff online, you will see um, very flexible policies about just about everything. Um, and I manage it by, again, going back to the idea of conversations with students. So one of the things that, it, how it's changed my practice, I think, is that in the past when I had pretty punitive policies, uh, I was catching students at the tail end of problems. Now I find myself having to ca try to, to catch students just as problems are beginning to occur as I begin to see them because otherwise I will get overwhelmed and the student will fall behind in ways that would be really detrimental to their progress. So for instance, with attendance, the moment a student um, misses more than one week of class, I reach out to them in as many ways as I possibly can 
to try to find out why that's happening. Um, I put in deadlines because I need to have some sense of the course progression for myself. Um, and I encourage students to come up with deadlines for their own work when we're doing projects. Uh, but none of my deadlines are hard deadlines except for the very end of the course when I have to turn in grades to the registrar. Um, so inevitably there are a lot of extensions or students um, moving around the deadline in one way or another. And I, uh, I use, um, we have a spreadsheet for how students submit stuff to our class. So I keep track of it that way. You can use the LMS. I found that certain types of organization are really helpful for knowing who's turned in what and when, but really for me, it comes back to conversations. Thank you. Um, do you want to say something, Laura? Looks like you're Yeah, I was going to just say that um, I think I also have things turned in digitally. So then you can sort of keep track of what is there and what's not, which a pile of paper is less visible for you just keeping track of things. But I was going to say that when I, I also keep deadlines, but I just always in many, like in writing and in conversa conversations in class, always emphasize that those deadlines can change if people have other things that are coming up or whatever reason. Um, but I, I just say that, like, you know, this is when I planned on grading things. If you submit it much before or later, you're just going to have to sort of wait for me to fit it in. So there's a, you know, if I'm being flexible, they also have to be flexible kind of conversation. That sounds so very human. Um, <laughs> and therefore alien and bizarre to the current higher education landscape. Um, all right, we're going to move on to the respondent section um, of our event here. We've got three folks um, who kind of come from uh, different positions, different disciplines, and different areas of the academy who are going to talk now. Um, Martha, can you give me a um, slide? There we go. Uh, so I'm going to start with uh, Jess, who is a senior at Plymouth State and also works with us in the CoLab. Um, and Jess has also been part of this um, primarily faculty and staff learning community that we've done on sort of innovative and student-centered pedagogies. So she's got a really interesting perspective. Um, take it away, Jess. You got some ideas to share? Um, and actually, I guess we'll stop screen sharing now um, and go in so maybe we can get a better shot of just talking. Hello. Um, did not test my mic uh, before I got here. I was in a little car accident, but we're good. We're we're here. We're doing Yeah, this. we have crazy weather here. So Jess texted that she was skidding off the road and we are so glad to see her healthy and happy face. So th thanks for being here, Jess. Yeah, so uh, coming up with some stuff on the fly here. No, um, uh, so I'm a student. Um, I, yeah, I've been participating in this uh, faculty staff learning community that we have. There's about 74 people um, for uh, a year now. Um, it's like all these faces on the screen, people I know. Um, it's been exciting to talk with faculty about grading, I mean, like this webinar that we're doing now, Martha's essentially given the same webinar before. We've had like the same conversations um, with faculty, like I'll sit there and like, at this point I've like talked so much about it, but something new comes every time. And I'm, um, I think that's really valuable to like have conversations about this, like webinars are cool and I'm on a webinar and I like this webinar. And, um, but like getting in rooms with groups of people and talking about uh, what ungrading is, what are the different ways to ungrade, what are our fears about ungrading, um, what are our hopes about ungrading uh, are, is very useful. And I highly encourage it, like, even if it's like not, there's not even like that big of an agenda just to do it. I think it's really important. Um, I think it's what I've seen is like, it's not exactly the same people in the room, but like it's uh, like about two thirds of the same people sometimes and then like a third new people. And that, even that um, is, is it brings, it's almost like I've practiced talking about ungrading with people that are scared of ungrading. So I like, at this point, I like know like what, what's gonna come up. Like people are gonna be like, I'm afraid of this. And it's like, now we have a response, like, or we know what we need to go look at um, so that we can come back for the next time and we'll have examples ready to go. And today I just looked at um, 
there's a I'm grading resource that is going to be posted later, I think. And it was so great. It had us um, links and like, of course, everyone could be like, read all these links and people be like, oh, I'll get to that someday. But like there's actual syllabus language, which I was looking at, which is pretty great. Um, I, I think like um, I am a fan of ungrading all the way. Like, I mean, I'm not going to say you should, everyone should just go right for it like without thinking about what you're doing. I think you should be thinking a lot about what you're doing and having conversations with students. And um, you can like put it in the syllabus and you should put it in the syllabus, but you should also be having conversations. I would replace all content with conversations, but that's not up to me. But like you, like I cannot stress enough, have conversations about what grades are and why and what learning is and why we learn. Like. Um, at this point, I really don't care about, I care about grades, but I, I care about assessing my own learning, um, and I kind of am offended when teachers think they can grade my learning, like, I care so much about my own learning and try to make sure that I'm learning things and taking advantage of what I'm doing in class that, like, I don't really care what teachers like think I learned or didn't when I'm constantly thinking about what I learned and what I didn't and reflecting on it. Um, and it, we were having, someone was, I think it was uh, Karen was in the chat talking about like, oh, students, they gave themselves exactly what I would have given them. And like, what does that mean when we say that? Are we affecting what students would give themselves? And I, I, don't know the answer to that. I know that when I was given some forms of self-assessment before they were, um, I would give myself lower than I thought that maybe I deserved, like, especially for participation, I would be like, oh, B plus, but like, I, people would be like, you deserve an A, and I'd be like, oh, okay. It's, um, I, I know people worry about that, and I can only speak for myself, but I like, I think, when you're having problems, I think you should really maybe just like think about how you can have more conversations with students. Like that helps. Like, like it's a recurring theme I hear. Yes. Yes. Every time we talk about something in the collab, it always comes back to like, have you talked with the students <laughs> about this? And um, and actually, due to Jess's participation this year, one of the biggest pieces of feedback that Kathy and I got when we looked through the stuff about the learning community is have some students have some students so um it's been really really helpful to have her there um and jess there's some stuff in the chat too so if you can look through that and um talk with people as as you're looking that would be great um rissa clarissa Sorensen and unru is up next and i'm going to do the same thing i did for jess and just say take it away Oh, that's scary. Um, so I wanted to kind of start with um, a quote that really inspired me today that brought back remnants of what Bell Hooks has said. And of course, Jesse made it in his newest article on AAUP, which is that teaching is a radical act. And we forget that. And I think it's radical because of the very human creative aspect of it, right? We're building relationships and we're trying to maintain those relationships. And grading basically undermines some of that relationship. And so for me, um, when I first tried this, I wanted to, I had seen it as immediately as a social justice issue. And I have been grading for, at that point I had been grading for a good 16, 17 years um, and thought I was the expert and I knew what it looked like and gosh, that's how it should be. And I saw the social justice piece that really that grading was undermining what I wanted to accomplish with my students and what Jess was talking about was exactly what that is, right? <laughs> Building self-directed lifelong learners. That was one of my major goals in teaching and I was undermining it. And so to convince myself that it could work and to convince others that it could work who are STEM folks, I did it in the hardest class you could probably possibly do it in first, which is organic two. 
Organic Chemistry 2. Because Organic Chemistry 2 is a prerequisite for medical schools and for pharmacy schools. And so it wasn't just about selling it to my administration or selling it to my students who were very used to grading by that point and found this to be unnerving to do this. Um, but also to the medical school <laughs> that they wanted to apply to. Um, and it was easier than I thought it would be to sell this. Um, basically because the idea here was that students should have agency in where they are and where they are going, but I would give some input into that too, and it would be a conversation. Um, and I think the conversation piece for me was important. I would love to get rid of grades in many ways now. I think they still undermine my, re my re relationships with my students um, in some important ways, but I'm bound by the constraints of where I teach and what I'm doing. And until I can change those constraints, I have to really think through what exactly I can do, what I can accomplish and what I can't. And so for me, ungrading has been probably the number one thing that actually convinces my students. I do active learning, I do critical pedagogic techniques. <coughs> None of those actually convinced my students that I care about them and I care about their learning. And um, that I really am serious when I talk about this as a conversation and something that is important to me that I want them to learn skills about how they learn and use them later. And so because of that, I tried ungrading and ungrading worked. <laughs> it was the thing that actually was like, oh, she's serious when she says this stuff. So for me, I continue to use it. I'm doing it in Gen Chem 2 right now. I tried it in Gen Chem 2 last semester, General Chemistry 2. I have 48 person lectures, but I've conceptualized how to do it in 400 person lectures. The 400 person lectures I used to do for uh, the University of New Mexico. Um, and so we have some, some interesting pieces about this. I think with 400 person lectures, you have to have people talking to one another more. You have to have more peer to peer evaluation than I've incorporated. But if you're interested in that, please let me know. I would love to talk with you further. And I've also starting to do it in statistics, just a little bit in the statistics classes I teach. So I teach, I teaches, yeah, I teach. So at this point, I'm going to yield my time to whatever Jesse is going to come up with. And there you go, Stommel. That's your cue. We're looking forward to it. Hi, um, I'm Jesse Stommel, and I um, I'm actually going to start by answering your question, Robin, about the um, the first question you asked that was asked in the chat about adjunct contingent precarious teachers and I, I so I published a blog post today which is because I've been thinking about this webinar for weeks and so I've been taking notes for a blog post at one point it was 4,400 words I got it down to 2,800 words but I just uh, published it today and I answer a version of that question in the blog post and so I'm just going to read a tiny tiny snippet snippet of it this is the blog post is called um, ungrading and FAQ. And the question on there, the way I phrased it here, and these are all questions I actually got, mostly quoted in some variation from the person who asked me. The question was, have you ever felt pressure from above to grade? If so, how did you overcome this pressure? What if I'm contingent, precarious, sessional, adjunct? It's really interesting, this word pressure and also this idea of pressure from above. And the way that our teaching practice ends up being influenced by this weight that we have on us from our institution, from, um, from this uh, vague above. So my answer, a couple paragraphs of my answer, I say the work of teaching is increasingly precarious and the ability of teachers to carve our own paths through the work is under threat. 
Academ academic freedom, like the ability to make critical decisions about our teaching practices, must extend to precarious teachers. So when we're talking about academic freedom, this choice about how we approach grading in our class, because as we've heard from so many of the speakers thus far, grading is such a central part of the work we do. Whether we're doing it or not doing it, whether we're grading or ungrading, it becomes a really central fixture in the way that we work. And I love what Rissa said, this idea that not grading ended up being a lever that she was able to pull to show her compassion and her care for her students. And I think that came out in what Jess was saying as well, that, um, that, that this became a moment of resistance for her to say, I don't care what grade you gave me. And I thought there was something really powerful in her, say, in her saying that a minute ago. Um, and the idea that precarious teachers, which is increasingly the vast majority of the teachers in higher education, the idea that precarious teachers would feel uncomfortable making decisions about such a crucial part of our pedagogical approach is really disturbing to me. And so I think that that should be a central part of our conversation about academic freedom. I go on in the next paragraph uh, in my answer to this question, each institution where I've worked has had a different set of rules, structures, and norms. Navigating those hurdles and institutional cultures has been a challenge. I've been contingent for most of my teaching career, 11 out of 20 years. During that time, I never put grades on student work. It took me over a decade to start talking as openly as I am here about my approach, some coping strategies that have worked for me. One, I make sure my pedagogy is well-researched. Uh, two, I bring students into the conversation about my approach. Three, I figure out what the firm rules are and follow them. Uh, and this is a key point that I found when so many folks say, I don't think my institution will allow me to grade. And I'll often hear that in workshops I give or when, when I give talks about ungrading. Well, my research won't allow me to ungrade or my uh, institution won't allow me to ungrade. And I say, where does it say that? Let's look it up. Let's look what the actual policy is. And I don't say that in order to be flip. I say that because sometimes we've internalized a lot more uh, rigid um, restrictions of what, what we can and cannot do in the classroom than are actually there. Uh, I will give a little bit of a proviso that there's two levels there. One, we need to look up what the actual rules of our institution are, but we also have to deal with and think through what the culture is and what the norms in our, at our institution are. And usually those norms are constructed by people in power, and yet it's students and adjunct and precarious faculty members who are subject to those norms in a way that the people constructing them aren't necessarily subject to them. And also subject to kind of the insidious nature of those norms. The way that certain expectations around grading will worm inside of an adjunct or a contingent laborer, and we won't feel like we have much power or control over that. So I think given that 70% of the academic workforce is contingent, we really can't deal with the issue of ungrading as long as our adjuncts and precarious teachers don't feel like they can be full and open participants in this conversation. And I'll just remind you something I said before we are going to open it up for questions and I'm happy to chat with all of you, but I'll remind you of something I said, which is that I was adjunct for 11 out of 20 years. And I have only come out about my practices around ungrading. I've only written about it publicly since I was no longer an adjunct. I have been in various precarious staff positions, but I was able to talk about this from a position of privilege. And so I think any of us who has a position of privilege needs to do two things. One, talk openly about this, help push the needle at our institutions so that the culture starts to shift. But I think that the other thing is that we have to clear the decks so that students and precarious faculty members or teaching staff can also feel open talking about this. In a sense, it's like we need to talk about it, but we also have to be willing to take the heat when other people talk about it and we need to stand up for them in a way that I, you know, I had people standing up for me, but I never had a sort of wall like I'm looking at right now across the top of my Zoom screen, a wall standing in the gap between me and the forces and pressures that would essentially keep me silent. Thank you, Jesse. 
Um, I'm going to ask Hannah Hounsel, who is one of our co-hosts tonight and who works with us advising students in the CoLab, um, because she's got an audience question for everybody who's up here on this uh, screen. What, what I have said to these folks beforehand is that we're going to try not to have everybody answer the question in a big line. Um, so maybe just pop up your hand a little bit if you think you might have something to say or unmute and jump in. So Hannah, what do you got? All right, so this question comes from um, Jared and he says there's a clear connection between ungrading and connections and relationships with learners. Connecting with online learners has its own contextual challenges. Does anybody have any advice for implementing ungrading approaches in an online course? Actually, don't raise your hand, just jump in because you're all spread out. <laughs> yeah. So I see a few people, but Kathy's going to start. Um, I, I don't, I haven't done ungrading in, in an online class, but an observation about having done ungrading with first year students, many of the conversations that we had were via writing. I, you know, some of them would come and talk to me about, you know, their goals and, but many of them seemed to prefer to have those conversations via writing. And so I, 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 I don't know, I'm interested in that in, in terms of how that might play out in an online class. So I've actually implemented ungrading in online classes. Um, and I think that I would agree with Kathy and that a lot of the conversation happens in a written form. But I also have a Slack channel that goes um, for my class that gives free folks a little bit more freedom to ask me questions and to DM me uh, directly, directly in a way that is an email. And so um, I think that that really adds an extra layer of like, I am invested in this relationship with you about grading about the grading practices and about this class and about the material and and let's talk about what needs to happen in order to make this uh, a good experience for all of us and so I think adding some pieces to the course that um, really allow the conversation and the relationship to develop also in an online form allows um, some extra you know this is an okay thing we're gonna try it out and if you have things that you want to talk to me about, then by all means, let's talk and let's do it in a written form offline in a way that doesn't feel as formal. Um, one thing that I add to the add to the mix is that I, I, I talked a moment ago about the different rules and restrictions that we have placed on us and as also the cultural expectations and cultural norms. But I think it's also important with this question about online learning to talk about the technical infrastructures that are basically at all turns teaching us how to teach. Um, learning management systems are set up and structured around the gradebook, which makes for, I mean, for any good that the learning management system does, one of the things that it does that I think is unequivocally bad is structure learning around the grade gradebook. Essentially, all roads point to the gradebook. And when I first started teaching online uh, 12, 13 years ago, it was such that all of the learning management systems I used required me to grade to even send a message to my students about their work. Some learning management systems are still structured that way. And so I had to figure out ways to trick the system to let me ungrade. And so that's a whole other layer of um, difficulty doing this work. I wasn't able to actually ungrade in a way that felt other than Uki to me until I moved my online learning out of the learning management system. Um, I just want to absolutely um, agree with what Jesse said and go as far as to say that if you're finding that um, your new approach to grading is thwarting the grade book of your LMS, then that means you are on the right track. <laughs> you are doing something right. Um, but um, in the topic of online classes, I've ungraded in online courses. And one thing that I wanted to mention is that in many ways, it felt like the most authentic way for me to approach assessment and the most healthy way for me to approach assessment for those of you who've taught online, as Jared mentions, one of the hardest thing is building relationships with students. Like, students who you may never see in person. Um, and there are a lot of ways, a lot of things can intervene in that relationship building that, that can thwart 
um, your ability to do that and not having grading be the center of your relationship with your students and the center of those conversations, I have found is it, it's revelatory in terms of working with online students um, because suddenly you truly can just have a relationship with them as a, as an, as a teacher and a learner. Um, so I would encourage anybody who's, who's teaching online to think about ways that they can implement ungrading. Um, I am trying to keep up. There's a lot of things going on, um, but I want to try to combine two questions into one. Um, Sean and Beth uh, have both asked uh, questions in the Q&A that I think are related. Sean is interested in what happens when you're teaching multiple, there's multiple sections of a particular course um, and one section is ungraded and the others aren't. How do you deal with colleagues who may think like, oh, they've got the, um, the easy section and uh, do you sometimes have to do some con conversation with students or with faculty about that um, challenge? Beth's question I think could be similar. It's about co-teaching and what, how do you get a co-teacher on board who might be skeptical about doing ungrading? Um, but really, I think what we're talking about are the politics in your departments and with your colleagues in some ways about um, ungrading and strategies you've used. Anyone want to chime in on that? Um, I have a somewhat, I, I have a somewhat, um, I actually do mean this one to be somewhat flip, this answer. Um, and that is to say that when I think about, uh, for example, a student taking my course and then taking someone else's course, and they might prior, I often get the question, well, what if they do the work for the other courses, but they don't do the work for your course because you're not grading? grading. And my answer is, I think it's good. Um, if the other course is putting specific demands on their time and setting very specific deadlines and they have very clear extrinsic motivators and they have to meet those, I say, hey, go meet those. Put my course off if you need to. And interestingly, what happens when I uh, just allow my students to work the way that I would work in the world, which is to set priorities, you don't set the things you want to do the most first, you set the things that are due at a particular time. I end up finding that students come back to the work for my course and end up being completely engrossed in it. And to the second part of your question, um, the part about co-teaching, I think co-teaching is one of the best things. And it's, it's the one place where I have done where I've experimented with extremely um, an extreme wide diversity of different grading approaches. And I love co-teaching because I end up grading in ways that I never otherwise would. I mean, I have put grades on individual student papers when I was co-teaching because it was a negotiated approach with the teacher that I was working with. And I loved doing that. And I loved getting to do that with the teacher and getting to negotiate how you're going to approach teaching uh, grading with a fellow teacher, I think is a great way to kind of get to the bottom of what of what you think about grading as a practice. Yeah, so I was going to talk about that because Jesse said something really interesting, which is put off my course. And in STEM, we don't have that compatibility. <laughs> like, that's not the way that works. Um, you got to take it in order and you got to have the information. And to the point of teaching a section that is unlike the rest of the sections. Um, from what I have seen in my next level course success with folks who have done this, is that my students are performing as well, if not better, because they were actually genuinely interested in the material, as opposed to being like, I have to go through the slog of doing this so that I can get a grade, right? We're trying to get folks to be interested in learning, and yes, we have to cover this material, and yes, it's important, but it's also really important that you actually might enjoy it or have some enthusiasm for it or God forbid, like it. And so in that case, uh, I don't think there's a big problem um, with having ungrading as a piece. It's really about what skills do you wanna help students build for the future as well, in addition to learning course content. Thank you. Um, with that, I'm going to throw it back to Hannah again, who has another question from our Q&A. And again, if you're asking questions in chat, that's fine because people are responding to you. But as panelists, we can't always keep up. So definitely use the Q&A if you want to make sure something um, gets in front of our eyeballs. Okay, Hannah. All right. So this question has a few parts to it. 
um, so I'll go slowly. Um, but how does one do ungrading in a multicultural and multilingual community? And um, are there any uh, best practices to do ungrading face-to-face -face if someone is not digitally savvy? And one more is parents and encultured expectations of grading and success. How do we do ungrading when that tension exists? So it's kind of three questions in one. I actually just want to start with a quick um, response because um, today I was talking on Twitter and a little bit with Kathy because um, we had some issues emerge in the section of a course uh, that we run here that's really uses a lot of open and emergent pedagogies and there were some real challenges that happened we teach in new hampshire which is an overwhelmingly white state and we have students of color at plymouth state but they're often very much in the minority in the classes and there were some really difficult dynamics unfolding in the class um, between this white majority of students and uh, the one black student who was in the class. And because the course was very student driven and very emergent, you kind of think of that as being empowering. But of course, all of those power dynamics come right into the classroom. And unless you have prepared for that um, in an open or emergent class, um, you can end up with some real challenges, which is what was happening. It was almost like the open pedagogy was augmenting the racism of the situation as opposed to empowering the um, sort of the vulnerable folks in the class, which is the opposite, of course, of what many of us want when we think of these pedagogies as having kind of a social justice orientation. Um, so I think a lot of these uh, questions about what are the relationships between context and culture and social interaction in thinking about grading. Um, there was also another uh, conversation I was getting in online um, on Twitter again with somebody who was saying, you know, like ungrading and that kind of stuff takes the rigor out of classes and people were sort of pushing back on that. Um, and he was saying, well, you know, more students um, are cheating and this and that, but all of these things, um, cheating and grading and, you know, all of that stuff have so many dimensions, right? There's the, the personal psychological dimensions of how an individual student might be dealing, like for example, a student with already a pre-existing anxiety disorder, right? And how are some of these things happening? There's the power dynamics in your class where you're seeing, for example, in my school, in a very white environment, how do the power dynamics um, there was an essay that came out recently about how male students are much more willing to advocate for themselves in grades um, with their professors and therefore often get their grades raised um, compared to, to female students. Um, so all of these things, I just think, this is not an answer to Svetlana's question, but it is a reminder that all of those dynamics that we deal with are, com are complicated. So if we just reduce this to kind of instructional design or some kind of um, pedagogy that's not inflected by all of those complicated dynamics. But that's why I just go back to what Jess said about talking with students. The reason that is so effective is not just because it's some kind of, you know, empath empathic like, you know, way of relating to humans, which is important. <laughs> But also because when you talk to people, you're, it's one of the few ways you're able to see the multi-dimensions of things that affect how these things play out. Um, so that's not an answer at all, except to say, I don't think there's any replacement for um, asking pe your students questions and for assuming that it's always going to be complicated. And even when we grade using numerical systems, all we're doing is obscuring the complications. We're not actually alleviating them or avoiding them, right? So all those power dynamics are still there. We've just um, covered them up with Kathy's, you know, yeah. objectivity theater um, phrase there. I would, and I would add that if you take grades off the table, but you don't actually fundamentally transform the power relations, you can actually cause more, do more harm than good. Because what you can, what you, what you end up with is you end up with nothing but hidden curriculum. You end up with nothing but invisible goalposts that our students are trying to reach. And the students who know how to reach 
hidden invisible goalposts. And the students who know how to deal with and handle hidden curriculum are the students who are good at school, the students who schools were built for, the people who are of the color and have the bodies and um, experience school in a normative way. And so I think what you have to do is recognize that you can't just pull grades off the table, but then not deal with those power dynamics. And part of that is recognizing and acknowledging your own biases. Part of that is exactly what you said, Robin, about having open conversations with your students. And I think also part of that is institutions recognizing that teachers, when we work with students, especially when we've been working with students for 20 years, um, that we have a lot of experience, a lot of data in our brain, that whether we're researchers or not, and whether we're putting that data on paper, we have a lot, we have a lot more than N equals one experience on what it is to be a student of color or a student who speaks a language that's not ours if we've been working with those students for 20 years. The, we're gonna, uh, there's one of the final uh, questions in the chat, who is Derrida? But I feel that we do not quite have the time to answer it. Um, but uh, thank you for all the questions. There's so much stuff in that chat that we were not able to get to, but I hope that the conversation can continue um, on Twitter using the hashtag ungrading. Um, but we wanna do a couple things before you guys all bust out of here because we wanna tell you what is coming and it's pretty exciting. Um, so we've got uh, two um, things that I think are, are pretty cool. Um, Martha is really to thank for, for most of this. She has put together so that bit.ly up top, Martha, that's the Google Doc, right, of resources, yep. So if you go in there, you'll just see a whole bunch of stuff that um, Martha mostly curated. I know Rissa helped with that as well, and some of our students. Um, so you can go there uh, in the immediate um, uh, aftermath of the webinar if you just wanna get some more stuff. Um, but also, I want to point to the bottom of that slide there because Martha and one of our students, um, Ashley Hitchborn, who is just a wonderful um, designer and artist, are putting together a beautiful um, kind of like a chat book project um, that's absolutely artistic and personal and warm. And it's, uh, it's really going to be quite lovely. It'll be available um, online. And we will e email that to all of the participants on the webinar and also link it on the resource page once it's finished. Um, that'll take a little bit longer to get off the ground because um, they've really been putting a lot of work into that. So there's stuff there if you need it. Uh, in the meantime, don't forget that most of these panelists are on Twitter if you need us. And you can also um, email me anytime um, at the Open Collab. My email is rderosa at Plymouth Dot edu and maybe Hannah can drop that right into the chat now as well. Um, so please find us. Uh, those of you who are in snowy regions of the country, I wish you safe, deep, Jess, please don't get back on the roads tonight. Um, and as for the rest of you with um, nice weather, we hate you. Uh, thank you for joining us um, at this ungrading webinar and we will stop our recording now and say good night. Bye.